I want to thank the organizers of the Fulbright Conference uh, for choosing the city of Atlanta. And I really can't express uh, what an honor it is uh, to host you tonight. As I was preparing to come and speak to you, I was told something that really amazed me, and that's in 38 years, uh, this very important meeting has been held for the first time in the United States outside of Washington, D.C. And since this conference is such a global gathering, a forum where ambassadors, heads of state, Pulitzer Prize winning journalists, Nobel laureates, scientists, and even astronauts gather to promote peace and understanding, I consider it a high honor for the city of Atlanta to serve as your host. But rather than giving you the typical Chamber of Commerce talk about the city of Atlanta, I'm going to do something a little differently in the small amount of time I have. Uh, I think that consistent with the Fulbright tradition of service and thought leadership, uh, Atlanta's success, certainly in the last 40 years, uh, really is the story of, uh, of two contrasts. Uh, if you go back just to about 1955, 1956, 57, and 58, two wonderful cities in the South, Birmingham, Alabama, and the city of Atlanta, were actually very comparable cities. In fact, Birmingham's economy was larger than the city of Atlanta because they had the steel industry. And uh, we had some pretty thoughtful leaders. And, and uh, if you look uh, in the late 50s and early 60s, something happened as we went through the civil rights movement in the United States. And I think that it was about leadership, Ken. So if you look at Birmingham and Alabama, you had a police chief named Bull Connor, and you had a governor named George Wallace who was moving Alabama and Birmingham in a different direction. And I think you had a mayor named Ivan Allen, and you had a governor named Carl Sanders. And when President Kennedy, you can clap for that, he's a special man. And when President Kennedy was looking for someone to testify, in favor of the Civil Rights Act, the mayor of Atlanta, a man named Ivan Allen, a former white businessman, raised his hand to go testify, a decision that almost certainly put a ceiling on the rest of his political career in the South. We had another event, a Nobel laureate, as you pointed out, Dr. Martin Luther King, won the Nobel. Uh, Ambassador Young uh, was with him. And when he won the Nobel in Atlanta, we decided that surely, since this was the first time this had happened, that Dr. King should be celebrated in Atlanta. And so we decided to have a dinner in the city of Atlanta. The only problem was is that nobody was buying tickets to the dinner. And so we had a forward-thinking businessman named Robert Wichert, who happened to be the CEO of Coca-Cola. And he got in a room over at the Capital City Club and he started, he said, bring me a list of names. He picked up the phone and he started calling folks one by one and he said, uh, I'm having a dinner party for Martin Luther King and if you want to continue to do business with Coke, I'd like you to come to my dinner party. So, that's important and relevant to why we're here because that was the first integrated dinner in the city of Atlanta in a hotel ballroom just like this. And I really think that those leaders and the way our community handled complex problems that were hard and challenging really did shift the direction of the cities without being dismissive of anyone. And so today as I stand here on this stage, the city of Atlanta and the Atlanta metropolitan region is the eighth largest economy in the eighth largest region in the U.S. and our economy is about 306 billion for our metro and we have a GDP that's bigger than 33 states. Hartsfield Jackson Airport that I hope you came uh, through today or to, to, to tomorrow or tonight is the number one passenger airport on the planet Earth handling 100 million passengers a year and the city of Atlanta which was just a small southern town now has the third largest concentration of Fortune 500 businesses in the United States of America. The point I'm making is, is that it's consistent with the approach that Fulbright has taken. And I think that you can make the argument that when you're big, when you're expansive, when you are welcoming, and when you make a decision to get to know people 
and decide that you can accomplish so much more by having relationships locally and around the world that we all have a future that is so much brighter. And so I think that really is the story of Atlanta. And now to get to the real reason that I wanted to be here tonight, and that is uh, to bring up a man uh, who I absolutely love. And he also happens uh, to have been my predecessor and a part of the chain of leadership that led to the story that I talked about. Uh, Ambassador Andrew Young um, really has been involved and his life goes through uh, the tapestry of the city of Atlanta in a almost flawless manner. He has been our congressman, he has been our mayor, he has been our UN ambassador, but most of all, he has been our conscious. Uh, when we made the decision to purchase the King Papers a few years ago, it was a really special occasion because we had to bid on them and I think uh, Ambassador Young and others helped raise about $30 million to, to purchase the King Papers. And so we had a wonderful night where many people who had been involved in that effort got on a plane and we flew to New York because Sotheby's had a wonderful display of Dr. Martin Luther King's papers. And as you walk through Sotheby's, they had the documents displayed from the ceiling so that you could read them without touching them. And as we walked through, you saw all of these notes. Tell Andy this. Have Andy look at that. And I was right beside him. And as we kept going, I saw tears roll down Ambassador Young's face as he remembered all of those times that he stood side by side and shoulder to shoulder with Dr. Martin Luther King. It was a transformational moment in my own life. Because of his work, his passion, and his leadership, I grew up believing that I could become mayor of the city of Atlanta. And when I was... And when I was 20 years old, I had the chance to be on the board of Howard University. We had student members on the board. And Ambassador Young was on that board. And I used to get to the board meetings and move the name plate so that I could sit next to him. <laughs> and so I was graduating from Howard. And I was thinking about taking a job in New York City. And he put his arm around me one day. He said, you know, son, you shouldn't take that job in New York City. You ought to come home because Atlanta's gonna need a mayor like you someday. 20 years later, I sat across the street in the Hyatt Hotel when they called me to tell me that I had been elected the 59th mayor of the city of Atlanta. And Ambassador Young is with me. I believe he is a national treasure. He is a Presidential Medal of Freedom winner. And he is your guest tonight. Ambassador Andrew Young. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. It, uh, he's a young man I'm very proud of. I can't tell you all the reasons why, but because you are such uh, an influential gathering of thought leaders, um, well, I guess I better take the time. He was running for a student body representative on the board of trustees, and his platform was that every Howard University student should voluntarily add $15 a quarter to their tuition to create a student aid fund for them to help students who were less fortunate. Uh, he was about 19 when that started. And I remembered when I was 19, I didn't have any thoughts like that. <laughs> I had other things on my mind. And I said to him, you know, uh, you better come on back to Atlanta because we're going to need a mayor like you in 20 years. And it was exactly 20 years uh, after he spent 12 years in the General Assembly and eight years in the State Senate 
uh, and I watched him, had very little to do with him, but I watched him doing the right things all along and I see him now. And one of the things that makes this city successful is that uh, the man he talked about, Ivan Allen, uh, kind of tapped me the same way. Uh, when I was uh, right after Dr. King's death, when we had a, a garbage worker strike here, and I ended up uh, sort of being the mediator between the union uh, and the city, uh, not intentionally, but just because it just happened that way. Uh, in j I went to jail with them and they listened to me and we worked it all out and, and Ivan Allen kind of sort of took some time with me to explain to me how this city really runs. He said, this city runs because business and government work together. And the emphasis is on what I came to call public purpose capitalism. That you define the public purpose, but you don't tax people. You don't, uh, uh, well, you don't raise money publicly. You raise money privately. And uh, the mayor talked about the airport, but that airport, uh, we can't figure out exactly how much it costs. Uh, but it's somewhere around 10 to 14 billion dollars over the last 25 years. And uh, it doesn't make any difference because it has an economic impact in the neighborhood of 38 to 45 billion dollars every year for the last 10 years. And there are 400,000 jobs. And um, it's sort of like a Fulbright idea <laughs> that we uh, sort of took seriously. I was not smart enough to be a Fulbright scholar, uh, but I was smart enough to fall in love with a girl who was on her way to Germany in Austria uh, in 1953 uh, as a volunteer at a work camp an international student work camp helping to build uh, refugee centers for people after the war. And uh, I had sense enough to tag along behind her and spent uh, the summer of 1953 uh, digging holes for uh, foundations for refugee structures. Uh, but I was with students from 14 different nations. Uh, living together, working together, and I, I got a feel for what the world is all about. I grew up in New Orleans, and the Nazi party headquarters was 50 yards from where I was born. So at four years old, my father said, look, white supremacy is a sickness, and these Nazis are white supremacists, but you don't let them get you upset. Don't get mad with sick people. Get smart. You kind of have to help them. He was a dentist. He said, I don't get mad with people when they come to me with bad teeth. He said, it's my job to fix the teeth. And it's your job in this world to deal with people who are sick with racism. You have to figure out a way to, to, to help them overcome that. They don't know any better. And you do. And I think it was learning from Mohandas K. Gandhi, uh, who started down in South Africa, incidentally, that uh, helped me to see that uh, there were spiritual and socioeconomic ways of overcoming racism and helping people to learn to live together as brothers and sisters. And we've seen that happen here. Uh, the decision that made Atlanta different was the business community decided there were not enough progressive white people to move the city forward. So they went out to Atlanta University and Dr. Mays and 
Rufus Clement and, and the presidents of Dr. Brawley, uh, the presidents of the universities and uh, the preachers and the doctors got together. And that made a coalition of conscience which was multiracial. And ever since the city has uh, started moving forward, uh, what brought that on was frankly that uh, Mayor Hartsfield, for whom the airport shares the name with Maynard Jackson, uh, bought that land for that airport for $90,000. And uh, he invited Delta to move here from Louisiana for a dollar a year. Uh, and um, he put up red lights on Peachtree Street. And he lost the next election. And so that's when the business community decided there just weren't enough progressive white people. So we formed this business black coalition uh, that has been, I think, the leader of the South, and I think the nation, and maybe even the world. And I'm just being humble about it. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to continue that. And we need you as thought leaders to understand that. Now, I've been pushing this young man uh, in a direction that he's not interested in. Uh, but I'm going to make it public because uh, his mama named him Muhammad Kasim Reed. His wife is a beautiful young woman who went to University of Michigan on a gymnastic scholarship. Uh, but she happens to be fluent in French. And between the two of them, Africa is divided Christian and Muslim. He's a good Methodist, but the name Muhammad will get him a long way in Africa. <laughs> but with her French uh, and his background, uh, that's a 1.2 billion stadium, dollar stadium going up there uh, for the Falcons. That wouldn't have happened without him. The F concourse, if you're going international, uh, was put together. We got runways all over the place. Uh, and we're flying to over 200 countries. And it's basically because we understand that uh, Atlanta has to be a part of a global economy. Uh, there is no other economy. And if you don't understand the world economy, which is not caused by any political party, but um, it's these damn things which have done more to change the world than the printing press did. And remember, the printing press in 1500, it took them 500 years to get the world back in order because every time somebody read a book, read the Bible in their own language, they started a new church and then they started a new country and uh, it was really after the Second World War uh, before Senator Fulbright and men like him uh, put together the United Nations, Ralph Bunch, uh, the International Monetary Fund, uh, the World Bank, and but from 1490 to 1944, this world was in shambles and in constant warfare. But that orderly vision of a stable planet uh, that included bringing us together with our enemies uh, is the vision that uh, Mahatma Gandhi repeated in India, Nelson Mandela in South Africa, uh, Martin Luther King across the South here, and I'm very, very proud to say that uh, the students, it wasn't the students at the University of Missouri. It wasn't, everybody puts the focus on the football team because they refuse to play. That's significant because that's a, a hundred million dollar business for the SEC, uh, television rights alone. But 
there was one student who fasted for two weeks and didn't say a word. Nobody knows his name. But it was the spiritual mobilization around that fast that got students, faculty, football players to respond to a moral issue and respond to it in a moral way. Now, I would have preferred that the president not be driven off. I would have preferred a win-win solution where he would have stayed there and they would have worked out these problems together because somebody asked me, was Pre Senator Fulbright a racist? Well, he had to be. I was a racist. You were racist. You could not grow up in America without being tainted by the sickness of racism, one way or the other. But we managed to learn, as Martin Luther King said, to live together as brothers and sisters rather than perish together as fools. We've got a long, long way to go. And people who have the kind of global vision and experience that you have are the natural leaders. Now, I'm going to stop now, and I'm going to say a blessing uh, that will carry over until you get something to eat. <laughs> <laughs> but you will be fed spiritually and intellectually, and I want to bless that too. May we pray. We're thankful, dear God, that you created us with a capacity to see beyond the sight of our eyes, that you've given us the capacity to open our hearts to those who are less fortunate, that you've given us minds to understand and be sympathetic and learn from those with whom we disagree. We pray that you would strengthen all of those values and virtues in our lives, that you would give us the moral and spiritual strength to take on the principalities and powers of evil in this world wherever they may be, and that we might see that the hungry might be fed and the naked might be clothed, the sick might be healed, and that the abundant life and the wonderful fellowship and brotherhood and sisterhood, the, the values that bring us together in this room might penetrate the hearts of men and women everywhere and that we might be strengthened and inspired to carry on the work of Senator Fulbright, which was also the work of Jesus of Nazareth and the prophets of the Old Testament and men and women everywhere who have sought to be a part of the spiritual aspects of this universe and not just creatures of flesh and blood. Strengthen our spirits. Bless us with these words of wisdom from our guest and keep us always safe and encouraged and visionary. And may we see truth in the midst of falsehood. May we see joy and the abundant life even as we're surrounded by the suffering sounds of television. May we keep alive that hope that all humankind might someday know that we are one in thee. Amen. impossible to follow that act. So we're going to show a, a short video that will give you further background on what our keynote speaker has been up to for the last 30 years. I will say this, he was one of two Nobel laureates last year. You may know the other person as well, Malala. But in, in the last 30 years, he has helped rescue 84,000 people from some form of slavery, human bondage, or forced labor. 
And I listened to him today in a press interview, and he was asked the question about how, how did you react when you received the Nobel? And he said, well, it wasn't the same as when I greet a parent whose child I've brought home and the tears come down my face. And I think that speaks to his character and we are very fortunate to have him here. I will probably not say the name correctly so I'll abbreviate. BPA, which is Save Childhood Movement, um, is the organization that has worked to save those 84,000 people. And one of the things that I would challenge our group to do is to see how Fulbright chapters, how the U.S. Fulbright Association can link arms with other U.S., other foreign to us, uh, Fulbright chapters and entities around the world to help in his cause, which is certainly part of education, because he will tell you education is a key component to keeping children, particularly out of those situations. And without further ado, we'll show a video, and then I'll ask Kailash to take the stage and share his thoughts with us tonight. Thank you. The Nobel Peace Prize for 2014 is to be awarded to Kailash Satyarthi for the struggle against oppression of young people and children. There is no greater violence than to deny the dreams of our children. I refuse to accept that the laws and constitutions are unable to protect our children. Today is the time for every child to have the right to life. I refuse to accept that the shackles of slavery can ever be more stronger than the quest for freedom. I refuse to accept here. Getting a greeting like this is all the reward Kailash Setyarti needs for freeing these children from a life of slavery. He tries to give these kids the childhood they missed. Do you think these kids see you as a Nobel Peace Prize winner? No, I don't think they, they see me as friend or brother or something like father. I have looked into their frightened and exhausted eyes. I've held their injured bodies and I've felt their broken spirits. I refuse to accept that children belonging to certain sections of society are born to work for others at the cost of their childhood and freedom and education. If the children are exploited, if the children are deprived from their childhood in any part of the world, the world cannot live in peace. The world cannot be human. It's not often the two winners of the Nobel Peace Prize get together, but it happened yesterday when President Obama met Kailash Satyarthi. They were joined by three children who were rescued from child trafficking and forced marriage. You cannot live in isolation. All the problems and solutions are interconnected. And so the problem of child labor in any part of the world is your problem. Satyarthi organizes raids with local police sometimes employers are tipped off and waiting for him armed. But I have been attacked many times in my life. You had a gun to your head? Literally, here. Yeah. This is dangerous work for you these days. Somebody has to pay the cost for freedom. It does not come on plate. So if I, if not me, then who else will do? Come the Nobel Prize. Who won the Nobel Prize, he asks. Their reply? All of us kids. It's good. <laughs> Every single minute matters. Every single child matters. Every single childhood matters.
listening to Ambassador Young was a spiritual experience for me. I have gone deep into the civil rights movement of this country. I was thinking of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King and just hugging you when I came to this hotel. It felt that I am touching the spirit of Martin Luther King. Thank you, Ambassador Yun. I'm also thankful to John and the entire board of Fulbright Association for giving me this great opportunity. And also listening to Mayor Mohammed Reed and Kim and others. In fact, though these two big lamps are facing on my head and face, but uh, I could see it. At least 200 enlightened lambs are looking at me and seeing me here. Each one of you is an enlightened lamb. Each one of you is a powerhouse. And one powerhouse can serve the electricity requirement of the entire town sometimes. But when you are sitting in the midst of 200 powerhouses, then I cannot express my feeling, that is my feeling. So thank you for that. Today, it seems that we are celebrating courage. We are celebrating the power of thought, the power of education, the power of peace. Today, we are celebrating the bright minds, their power and their vision. And of course, I don't, I can't recall actually any other association or organization which has a legacy of 54 Nobel laureates and 31 head, heads of the state, which you have. Congratulations for that. And if you have that much of legacy, if you have that much of power, that much of light, that much of energy and enthusiasm and great minds. I am sure that the people sitting in this room have power to change the whole world, to make this world a better place for all of us. I came here this afternoon, and many of the friends, including Kim, was asking, could you take a little bit rest? My friend Anjali was giving me some hot water for my throat. And um, I'm not feeling tired being midst of you. But back home, I was informed that during last one year after the Nobel Prize, we have received over 18,000 invitations. And it will take me, they have made a rough calculation that it will take 92 years if I attend most of them. <laughs> so I have to live for another 92 years. Uh, when um, Albert Einstein got the Nobel Prize for his theory of relativity, he became very famous and he started getting many invitations and attending many meetings and conferences in universities and giving lectures. One day his driver found that he is getting tired. So driver suggested that I have an idea, sir, he said. What idea? He said, you look tired, but I have learned every single word, every single sentence, listening to you all the time. 
So next time when you are invited at a place where people did not see your photos, because those days they didn't have this uh, smartphone which Ambassador Young, you took out from your pocket. They were not, uh, these smartphones were not there, so most people have not seen his picture. They said that I can manage with you, you can sit in the back and let me deliver that lecture in place of you. So the new Einstein went on the dais and delivered a great speech. Everybody was thrilled and because uh, this man was not at least so tired. So he spoke every good thing. After a lot of applause, a professor stood up from the back and asked, sir, I have a question. He had a question. So this new Nobel uh, laureate, new uh, Einstein, listened the question carefully and told him, Sir, I was hoping that you will ask a tough question, but it was such a simple, such a childish question. Even my driver who's sitting in the back can answer that question. <laughs> I'm not so lucky to have such a driver so far. <laughs> but today when I asked, ask all of you, that what has enabled you to bring here? can say your hard work, your great mind, your parents, your career. Good, it's true. But what is the most important factor which brought you over here and made you unable to do so, to become a Fulbright scholar or alumni? The two things, and they are so interconnected, like two sides of the same coin. One is freedom, and the second is education. If you're not given education, you can never become a Fulbright or any, anything in the life. If you're not given freedom, then you cannot even get education. So for the last 32 years, I have been advocating that freedom and education are two sides of the same coin. We have to fight for both simultaneously. In a world where we, are, we have achieved so much in technology, in IT, in so many spheres of life, there are millions of children who are not so fortunate. They are trapped into slavery. When I go to Ivory Coast and talk to a group of children and ask them, what is your dream? The children who are working day in and day out in producing cocoa beans, that is the core ingredient of chocolate. A child says, I have no dream. Then I asked, how do you like chocolate? He looked at me, what chocolate is? Chocolate is sweet candy. Bar. He looked at other faces. He said, no, I have never heard of chocolate. I have never had chocolate. A child who lost his childhood and freedom and education and health and everything, producing something which is the core for production of chocolate had no idea of chocolate. In Pakistan, when I talk to a group of children, what is your dream? A child says that the child who is working and is stitching footballs, and each time when he stitch, there is a danger that the needle can go into his fingers and he suck his, suck his blood and kept on working in slavery. And he answered, I have no dream, sir. After insisting again and again, he says that if you, are give, if you give me a chance, I would like to hit a football, real football. I wanted to play with football one day. He stitches football, but he had no dream to play with one. There are 168 million children are working in full-time jobs. 
85 million children are working in extreme forms of child labor, and millions are still enslaved, and some of them are born and grow up in slavery. They have no chance to education. Dear friends, after giving, giving up my career as an electrical engineer and teacher in the university, I started this campaign in 1981 when a desperate father came to my small office of a magazine which I was publishing for the cause of the most deprived children. And it was the time when child labor, child slavery, these things were non-issues in my country or anywhere in the world. People thought that slavery has been abolished in 18th or 19th century. It was not the modern reality. This father told me that his daughter was about to be sold, 15-year-old daughter who was born and grew up in slavery at Brick Hill. The owner was selling her off to a brothel. When I was writing the story, I decided that it is not enough. If she was my daughter, if she was my sister, what would I do? I gave up my pencil and paper and, and decided to go and rescue. I went to that brick kiln. I collected some friends and some money. But we were beaten up. We were thrown away from the kilns. This man, his name was Basal Khan, Mohammed Basal Khan, he was caught. His 15-year-old daughter could not be saved. I came back empty hands in Delhi, where I used to live. I spoke to some friends, and finally, we, with the help of court, we succeeded in freeing 36 children, women, and men. That was the first incident of freeing child slaves in India in 1981. But I realized that it is not an Indian problem. It's a national, national problem. It is a global problem. We organized a worldwide march across 103 countries in 1998. That gone for six months from three corners of the world with a demand that there should be an international law to combat slavery of children, trafficking, and worst forms of child labor. You will be surprised to know that until 1989, there was no articulated concept of child rights in the world. Only in 1989, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child was adopted. Similarly, in 1999, 10 years after that, very recently, this law, international law against uh, worst forms of child labor was adopted by the ILO General Assembly. So we organized this march, and that time, 268 million children were in full-time jobs. And that was only in 2000. In 15 years, the number of child laborers in the world has decreased from those 268 million, 260 million, to 168 million. Almost 100 million children were saved during these 15 years due to building a worldwide movement. And that's why I call the fight against child labor is a global civil rights movement. <laughs> the number of out of school children in 2000 was 130 million those days. But slowly, when the civil society geared up, I was one of the founders or co-founder and president of the Global Campaign for Education. The number has gone down from 130 million to 59 million, less than half. So these numbers. Jennifer said number matters. Number definitely matters. We have seen in 15 years' time, this number is decreasing. So I hate passivity and pessimism. I strongly believe that history is not created by those who just criticize or clap from outside. 
history is written by those who had courage to jump in the ring without caring will they fail or succeed. We did it and it's possible. We made it possible. It's not me alone. Several people joined hands. We must know that education is the most powerful enabler, most powerful equalizer, most powerful weapon or a tool to fight poverty and all sort of miseries. We who believe in the power of education perhaps are not so engaged or perhaps are not so devoted for this cause. We know the power of education. But there is other group, small number of people who know the power of education. They are feeling threatened. What happened in Pakistan about a year ago when a group of handful of these terrorists attacked a school. Why did they attack a school? Because they wanted to, they were feeling threatened by education and they wanted to create a situation of terror in schools so that the people should not send their children to school. 140 children were gunned down within few hours. I was talking to the group of mothers and fathers and one of the mothers told that I sent my son to school in uniform and he came back in coffin. Because these people feel threatened by education. What has happened in Kenya? More than 100 young people in the university was gunned down in, 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 in one night. In, two, in, in, in Nigeria, 200 girls were kidnapped and half of them are not yet found and nobody has, their, has an idea what is their fate. So these people know that if all children are educated, then the power of these terrorist outfits will be weakened. And I always say that when a child picks up a pencil, it weakens the power of millions of guns. And that's why we have to work hand in hand. There's no problem in the world which can be seen or solved in isolation. After 9-11, it's very clear that the world has to be united to fight out these forces. When it has been recognized scientifically that the world is in danger because of the global warming and ecological threats, we have to be united to solve it. When the economic slowdown comes and go, then we have to think that no country can solve this problem. We have to work hand in hand. Dear friends, we live in a world of globalization. We have achieved a lot in globalizing markets and economies and products. We have achieved a lot in globalizing information and technology and data and digits. We are very fast in connecting with the world and each other through the high-speed jets. As I said, I came this, this afternoon and I'm leaving tomorrow morning and reach India. Hundreds of thousands of aeroplanes connect us every day. But dear sisters and brothers, young friends, what is missing in the world is the connect through compassion. You need not to borrow compassion from outside. I always say that compassion is a wealth, is a treasure which is inside each one of us. We are born with compassion. Let us try to convert that compassion into a social movement. And that is possible when we work for freedom and for education. We know that we cannot bring justice, economic justice, and social justice to the people, even gender justice in the poor countries or anywhere in the world without education. There is a latest report of the World Bank which proved that just one year of schooling for all children in a country will help in an increase of 0.34% annual GDP. 
Additional GDP would be increased if a country is educated for one year. If all people of that country is educated for 10 years, then there would be about 3.5% additional GDP growth. There is another report which proves that one year of schooling in the life of a person in childhood, in primary schooling, helps in an increase of 10% earning in the later stage. And one year of secondary schooling for the same child helps in 20% increase in income in the later stage. There are very hard facts. So when we talk of education, we are talking in economic terms also. When we talk of freedom, we talk of economic terms also. It is not only humanitarian issue, it's a major political as well as economic issue. Globally, 168 million children are in full-time jobs. As I said, on the other hand, 200 million adults are jobless. And who are these jobless adults? There are studies in Nigeria, in Kenya, in India, in Mexico, in Peru, in Philippines, which reveal that these unemployed adults are not none but the very parents of child laborers. The children are preferred in jobs and denied education because they are cheap source of labor. And parents remain jobless because they are expensive workforce. So poverty, illiteracy, and child labor are interconnected. That makes a triangular paradigm. We have to break that cycle. We, have, we can break this cycle with collective efforts, with strong vision, with the strong courage, bold and innovative initiatives as a global community. We have to build the value of global citizenship. And that is possible. I am planning to launch the world's most ambitious and the largest campaign ever involving and engaging young people. Almost 100 million children are the victims of violence, slavery, trafficking, illiteracy, poverty, acute poverty, malnutrition, ill health, etc. 100 million, roughly. But on the other hand, 100 million plus young people and children in the schools are full with energy and enthusiasm, but also have a strong sense and element of idealism. They are hungry to do something. They are hungry to prove themselves to do something good. So my campaign would be 100 million for 100 million. Let the 100 million young people be given a better alternative to life to prove themselves to make this world a better place for other 100 million children. Let them give leadership because there is a hero inside every young person. We have to dig out that hero and that leader to make a better place for world's children. And finally, a uh, story of uh, uh, ancient uh, Indian uh, scripts remind me. It says that when uh, there was a uh, saintly man, a guru who was living in jungle and teaching some bright people, only the brightest people, like full bright people. So the full bright, one of the full bright person came, not from you, an ancient age, he, he was a prince. So he came with some sort of ego. Uh, he was a prince after all, so he came and knocked the door of that person in jungle that guru, uh, and uh, from inside, this teacher asked, who are you? He said, I'm prince of your state. The teacher did not open the door. He said, I'm prince. He did not open the door. He did not listen. He said, who are you? He said, my name is XYZ, whatever his name. Two, three times, he did not open the door. The prince became very angry and went back. 
he was sitting and asking other people and including his father. The father said, you must go back to this teacher. He is the great teacher. So he came back again. And this time he was knocking the door. And teacher asked, who are you? Then after a while, this prince said, if I knew who am I, then why should I come to you? I didn't know who am I. Then the teacher opened the door and he went in and studied for a few years. But when he was going back, and others were also going back in the convocation, teacher asked, who are you? He said, I am fire. I'm a spark. I wanted to enlighten the whole world. I will sacrifice myself, but make sure that no part in the world remain dark. I am fire. And then the teacher stood up and hugged all students and blessed them that you are fire. My dear friends, the Fulbright scholars, you are fire. You have to enlighten the whole world. You have to enlighten the whole world. And thank you, and wish you the great success in your life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. There is a small token of our, our affection and our gratitude, which we hope you'll carry with you. And, uh, Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. Thank sir. you so much. You're very inspiring. Thank you so much. I regret that why I did not come here early, 20 or 30 years ago, to be one of the... I could have applied for the Fulbright Scholarship. <laughs> but if I'm not late, I can do it now. So you can consider me as the part of the family. Thank you so much. <laughs>